two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I mean, it's having it hybrid is the. Uh, I mean, it's not hybrid actually. It's, it's just we are mm. streaming, but yeah. Even that, mm. 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 Is your mic on? Now it's on, yeah. <laughs> so. No. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think microphone is working. I hope also uh, the video, so the YouTube, uh, the <laughs> Zoom is working. So let me 
start this, uh, this summer school. And first of all, let me welcome every one of you here to this uh, VCQ summer school in 2021. So I have to say it's a real pleasure to see, you know, the, at least the, the lecture hall at least half full and even more people attending here um, uh, via, via the Zoom, via, via the online feature. Um, yeah, so I think it also for most of you, it's, it's probably one of the first conferences for, for many months. And I'm particularly also happy that, that the speakers agreed to come here in person and, and make this really a uh, summer school experience as we had it two years ago. So uh, my, my name is Peter Rabel, and I'm currently here talking to you uh, uh, concerning, uh, as, as two uh, roles, sorry. Um, uh, how do I press on? Oh, so, okay. Okay, so I think it has moved. But maybe can. Yeah, so first of all, I'm, I'm currently head of the Atom Institute. So that's the place where, where this uh, summer school will take, uh, take place here. So that uh, the uh, Atom uh, Institute for Atomic and Subatomic Physics is, is part of the Technical University of Vienna. So this is uh, one of the uh, two main universities here in Vienna. Most of the buildings are there, uh, you know, all, uh, uh, are actually located inside the city, so near the, near the Karlsplatz. But our institute here has a, has a special role. Let me see if I can. And, and that's also the reason why it has been built a little bit outside of the city center, because we hear a nuclear uh, research facility. Okay, so in, in the back here, we have a small nuclear reactor, a trigger reactor it's, uh, is the technical term. So you can see here, uh, see a top view. And also it's something where you can really go upstairs, go up the stairs and look down and you really see this beautiful Cherenkov radiation, which I think is, is, is not accessible in many, many other places. So compared to you know, other research facilities, uh, neutron research facilities, this is a rather small reactor. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not, not very powerful. But we are still very proud of it, and just to, uh, to mention this, this fact, so this was actually this, the same facility was used in, in 1974 by Helmut Rauch, so one of the really quantum pioneers here in Austria, to demonstrate for the first time neutron interference, okay, so people have seen before uh, interference of massive electrons or so, but this was the first time uh, this could be achieved, and here is kind of the original data that was, was measured at this facility. And this was really also a starting point for a lot of the quantum physics that went uh, that started afterwards in Austria and many other names, you know, probably Anton Zeilinger or also here Jörg. I mean, they started here doing neutron physics and then switched gradually to quantum optics, atom physics, and now doing all this fantastic work. Okay, but this is uh, only one part of the Institute. And as I already mentioned, so nowadays there's still some of these uh, radiation physics, neutron physics, uh, fundamental principle with neutrons going on. But a large part of the Institute by now is actually uh, doing, um, uh, you know, we're doing much more things. So in particular, also quantum optics called atom physics, uh, quantum metrology. So in general, there has been a big move towards quantum technology related um, topics. And that's also the reason why you are here today. So to really hear about uh, particular quantum metrology, but also about all the systems like cold atom systems, quantum optical systems that can be used to access these, these uh, nice properties. Okay, so that's a little bit about, about the Institute. Then let me say uh, to, uh, to a few words about the, the VCQ. Okay, so the VCQ is now a joint center. It does not only include uh, this institute or the, uh, the technical university, but it's actually a, a collaboration center between the university, the Austrian um, uh, Academy of Science, the, the Technical University of Vienna, and the IST Austria, which is a rather new institute that was just funded uh, kind of 10 years ago, a little bit outside of Vienna. And this center by now just uh, look at the web page. So here are the currently the, the faculty members are involved. Maybe you know some of these names, but we are constantly growing and kind of more and more people kind of joining the center, which is mainly about, you know, co collaboration, uh, organizing joint events like the summer school, joint colloquia, and simply bring people together 
uh, uh, in, uh, so bring people, um, all the people together in Vienna that work in this kind of quantum science and quantum technology direction. So here's just a few uh, uh, you know, central topics that the center is working on. So you see it's quite diverse and really ranges here from uh, you know, very fundamental aspects like quantum aspects of, of space time to more applied things like quantum com computing, quantum sensing, which is also the topic here for, for today. And in general, you know, something like hybrid foundational aspect, as well as more applied uh, aspects in this field. And simply we found not everybody here in the center is working on, on the same things, but we, we found, you know, putting all, uh, all these people you have just seen before together, that we really have a huge overlap. And the center is really one, uh, one instrument that we use to kind of to, to focus this research here in Vienna. Okay, one uh, main aspect about VCQ is maybe uh, not only the, the kind of the collaboration in terms of doing actual research, but also kind of education and specifically also PhD education. And for this purpose, we have kind of now uh, uh, this VCQ uh, PhD school. So I think that's, that's so it's not just a, uh, it's not a, a, an official program, okay, where you can directly enroll on. So people here that participate in this school, they enroll in the university or the technical university. But we, we think it's, 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 it's nice in order to foster this collaboration already on the PhD level. We uh, created this umbrella to really have also kind of joint recruitment calls, uh, give up fellowships, uh, this, this summer school, as I mentioned before, having mentoring systems, and also a lot of social activities, uh, which were, okay, didn't take part uh, last year, but today, uh, the, this year we already had a barbecue and there will be a retreat and many other, I think also a sports event is organized currently so to bring PhD students together, so it's all about fun. Okay, and this brings me already to the last slide and one of the, the big uh, traditional events that we organize within VCQ, formerly the Cocos program, for those of you who know, know this, uh, is the summer school. So it, it includes, it's always about a different topic each year, uh, students decide uh, which topic they want to hear about. We all only have invited the best speakers uh, for this, for this, uh, for this schools as evident from, from the list you see over here. And one important thing is also that this summer school is entirely organized by the students, okay? They decide on the topic, they decide on the speakers, they organize everything. And this is really a great effort. And I think this year also it worked particularly well despite the circumstances. And uh, this year yeah, it was uh, thanks to Federica, Bajuma, Rija and, and, and Dacic. And I think they will introduce themselves afterwards. But a big thanks. Uh, to this uh, great uh, organization effort. And in addition, I also want to highlight here, Nadine uh, Hilmer, she's currently, the, she's currently the coordinator of the of this school. And I think many of you had uh, anyway, email contacts and she will handle the things also in the back. Okay, so with this, uh, there's were a few opening introductory words and for all the rest, I would uh, li like them to hand over the microphone to, to the students who did all the work. And once more, thanks for organizing. Thanks for coming and thanks for already in advance for presenting very nice lectures as well. Okay, speak to uh, Thank you very much, Peter. It's truly uh, an honor to be here now and, and it's almost surreal to see uh, real people in a real lecture hall. Uh, so um, just as a reminder, uh, we are, uh, so first of all, again, I, I introduce myself. My name is Amin. Uh, my family name is Tajik, so don't get confused. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah, <laughs> I got used to it already. Um, so uh, Pradumna, Ria, and Federica sitting behind the camera, so camera woman today. Uh, very happy to have you all here. Um, we are still as you are all wearing masks in the middle of a pandemic. So let's start with safety measures. Uh, so uh, please, uh, if you're not yet tested, because some of you aren't, please keep your masks even in the lecture hall. But after you have your negative results, you can remove your mask while seated in this lecture hall and outdoor, of course. So uh, in the corridor, so the weather will be nice, hopefully. In the corridor, please wear your mask. And uh, for the coffee, we will have very good coffee from uh, Cafe Couture. Um, 
please, uh, if you queue uh, in front of the coffee uh, place, please just keep your distance and uh, follow the lines that we, we have there. Let me see what I have else to say. Ah, great. Okay, you received goodie bags, and in the goodie bags, you have the timetable, you have the safety measures that I just said, and you have uh, lunch options because for this one and a half hour uh, time that you're on your own, you can go around and, and, and uh, eat at one of these places. Although you can also walk 10 minutes to Schlachthausgasse, U3, and take the U-Bahn to Wien Mitte or wherever else. You, in, in almost 10 minutes, you are in the city center. So you can go eat wherever you want, actually, in one and a half hour. Just have to plan a bit beforehand and go directly there. Um, for the internet, actually, let me bring the slides. So for the Wi-Fi, whoever has access to Eduroam, it's fine, just connect to it. If not, in your badges, we folded uh, a username and password in this form with which you can log in into the Wi-Fi called TuNet Guest. So this is how it works. This is just a sample. You have your own, everyone has its uh, her or own username and password. You can use it. Um, uh, the next thing I want to mention is the special, the VCQ special lecture on Thursday. Uh, many of you already have registered. If not, please register in the link that we sent you because we have to know how many people are actually attending and want to want to sit in the lecture hall. So please do that. Uh, anything else from your side? Yeah. Ah, true, important. Yes. And as, as you see, we are, we are live streaming uh, on YouTube and also recording the videos. Your pictures, your face might appear in one of those. If you have objections, please tell us in beforehand so that we organize it in a way that you, uh, you won't appear in those pictures and videos. Um, so that's it. I think uh, we are good to start with the first lecture. Thank you. So uh, before we start, uh, maybe, I mean, I think everyone knows uh, Fedor very well, but uh, let me do the formal introduction. So uh, Fedor is uh, currently a director of the Institute of Quantum Optics and fellow of the Center for Integrated, hmm. Integrated Quantum Science and Technology. So that's IQST at uh, Ulm University. Uh, he uh, studied in Minsk and finished his PhD in 1998. Uh, and then after his uh, habilitation in 2010, in 2011, he became professor at uh, University of Ulm. And uh, since then, he's working in the fields of quantum technologies, quantum information processing, and fundamental physics using NV centers in uh, diamonds. So thank you, Fedor, once again uh, for being here. And yeah, we are looking forward to an amazing lecture series. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank all organizers uh, of the school. And uh, thank you for joining uh, this school in person. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at Quantum Center and it's a success story to hear the uh, advances of the school. It's this uh, PhD school has a long tradition now and uh, I'm looking forward for very exciting lectures uh, during next days. Um, all right, uh -huh. yeah, I just, uh, mm -hmm. so you will, you will switch it, yeah. 
<clears throat> All right. So my lectures will be devoted to uh, solid state uh, spin qubits in diamond. And uh, I'm going to uh, cover a few top.
are synthesized in several ways. One of the uh, most known one is so-called high pressure, high temperature synthesis, where you synthesize diamond from carbon uh, under condition where diamond is a stable phase. Uh, and another way to do this is uh, a CVD growing from plasma, where you take a seed crystal, you put it in a mixture of the, uh, of the uh, hydrogen and methane, uh, and in the plasma, there is a layer by layer growth of a diamond phase on the top of the seed crystal. So here I would like to show you a, a mo short movie how this happens. Uh, this is a courtesy of uh, my colleague, uh, Daniel Twitchell and Matthew Merkham from uh, A6. And uh, see. So I would like to show you how this how it happens. So you see the seed crystal on the bottom, and from the top, the ionized uh, uh, methane and uh, hydrogen uh, molecules come and touch the surface. So methane can be attached and forming the layer of diamond, atomic layer by atomic layer. And so by controlling very well the, the purity of gases, uh, you can grow diamond that is extremely pure with, uh, with a concentration of unwanted impurity on the order of uh, part per billion. So this is a live picture now. Uh, on, you see the seed crystal and now the plasma will be switched on. And so we, we will see then how the uh, layer of diamond will be grown on the uh, surface of the uh, seed uh, crystal. Um, color centers are uh, basically optically active system inside of this uh, ultra pure lattice. Uh, as I mentioned before, nitrogen vacancy center is one of the most known one. When present in a high concentration, it uh, make diamond slightly pinky. Uh, and this happening uh, on the, when you have uh, about one part per million of carbon atoms substituted by nitrogen and there is a vacancy nearby. So these impurities uh, like color centers give a color to diamond because they have a strong absorption and uh, emission. And this absorption lead to this uh, slightly, uh, slightly pinky uh, color of, uh, of the diamond. Um, NV center, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a nitrogen uh, at the lattice position plus a vacancy nearby. Do have uh, two charge states that are observable in the optical spectra. What you see here is a fluorescence emission spectra with a neutral charge state uh, having a zero phonon line at 575 nanometer and uh, the negative charge state at uh, uh, 637 uh, nanometers. These two charge state can exist uh, in uh, depending on the uh, doping of diamond. One or another charge state can be dominant. For most of our experiments, we are going to be interested in negatively charged uh, in V-center in diamond. This is again energy level structure of the uh, of the uh, NV center for both charge states. On the left side, you have negatively charged NV center with a triplet ground and excited state and uh, two singlet states. And on the right side, I show here the energy levels of neutral charge state, which have zero phonon line at 575 nanometers. So most of experiments we are going to talk about are performed with a negatively charged state. What is special about this uh, charge state of NV center is that it possesses ground state uh, triplet, uh, and this triplet state uh, can be very well controlled and initialized. Optical <coughs> excitation from the ground state to excited state lead to spin selective shelving uh, of the population. And after a few excitation cycle, you end up with a system 
to be polarized in the MS equal uh, zero state. And that's allow you to initialize the spin qubit with very high uh, fidelity uh, within a very short time, uh, less than a microsecond. And in addition, as I will show you later on, uh, this spin selective uh, optical transition allow you to read out the state optically, allow you to get access to the spin state using uh, optical uh, spectroscopy. Uh, how to measure the spin state using uh, optical techniques? So usually magnetic resonance is not very sensitive approach, but coupling spins to photons allow to measure spins in a very efficient way. So what uh, we typically do in our experiments, we excite uh, color centers from the ground to the excited state and for the plus and minus one sub levels of the ground state triplet the population gets shelved to the singlet state so called the dark state and that lead to the lower fluorescence intensity in a fluorescence response uh, after a few excitation cycle the spin get repolarized so you will end up in the system to be polarized in ms equal zero state but for the first few cycles, there is a significant difference in fluorescence intensity depending on which uh, spin state you have been starting. And this is a basic mechanism for preparation of the spin state and for readout of the spin state of these uh, color centers. Now, uh, what are the energy levels? So there are spins, uh, but those spins are a bit more complex here as a spin half system. Uh, this ground state is a spin triplet, so there are three spin sublevels, and they are separated even in zero magnetic field by about uh, 2.8 uh, gigahertz, plus there is additional splitting uh, of the spin sublevels associated with external magnetic field. So spins react uh, on, external, uh, on external field perturbation. Uh, this allows you to tune the energy levels. There is a level anti-crossing at about 1,000 Gauss where zero and plus one state uh, cross. Similar structure at room temperature can be also observed for the, uh, for the excited state. And uh, in the excited state, this uh, zero field splitting is a bit smaller, about 1.4 gigahertz, but the rest of the energy level structure is very similar. However, those states are rarely used for any coherent control uh, techniques because they decay very quickly uh, by a, a optical decay uh, to the ground state. Now, how the experiment look like? We say that uh, optical uh, spectroscopy and microscopy allow you to be very efficient in reading spins. <clears throat> and in order to combine this uh, spin spectroscopy and optical microscopy, essentially you need to build an optical microscope that is combined with a uh, toolkit to excite uh, uh, the spin. So excess of microwave and static magnetic field. So we do have typically a, a home build in most of the cases, optical microscope, where you see bright spots. So the single color centers, <clears throat> we apply uh, static magnetic fields to tune energy levels of the uh, spins. We apply a microwave line to excite spins coherently. And uh, we also, uh, to make sure that we work with single color centers, we use uh, photon correlations to check whether we have single emitters uh, in our system. So this is how uh, our uh, setup looks like. So we have an optical microscope where we focus the light. On the back side here, you do see electromagnet, and the sample is fixed in a microwave strip line where we can send a short tuned to resonance microwave pulses, allowing to control uh, spins. Uh, using uh, microwave techniques. Uh, this is a zoom in into sample itself. I mentioned that we work typically with the ultra pure diamonds drawn by CVD technique. And uh, in this case, uh, we have our, uh, our diamond with a microwave line deposited on this. In this very narrow region, we uh, generate our color centers and uh, they can be excited by microwave and accessed uh, from the top uh, using uh, optical, uh, optical microscopy technique. 
Um, the, the proof that we work with single uh, imagers, single spins, uh, uh, can be, uh, this can be uh, checked with a, uh, article relation, with a correlation uh, of photon check. Every single emitter emit photons one by one. And so by measuring photon correlation, or so-called G2 function of photons, you can uh, investigate uh, how many color centers you do have in your spot. Here you see an example of this experiment. So it's a ray of single NV center written in a diamond used in ion implantation. And uh, you can measure G2 function of these color centers as a, at low temperature or at room temperature. And in both cases, actually at zero delay times, so basically probability uh, to have uh, two photons with certain delay time, which is shown here for zero delay time, you get uh, a drop of probability to detect uh, pairs of photons. So it's a single atom is a single photon source that you uh, can see here in both cases. At low temperature, you also see a few rabi oscillations, speed optical coherence, is also getting a bit longer so that you can get a few uh, optical Rabi flops. But what is interesting for us here is that see here at zero delay time, the G2 function value is close to zero. And we can uh, now prove that we can work with single color centers and those color centers now carrying the spin. So we can access the spin state of uh, single uh, quantum systems. So how to do magnetic resonance? Uh, on this uh, systems and this setup, uh, we image uh, color centers, as you see on the right side, again with a confocal microscope. In this case, <coughs> color centers are not very well ordered. They are kind of occurring during the growth here. Nevertheless, you can isolate one, you can measure G2 function of uh, single color centers, and now you can apply microwave and we can apply different pulse sequence, typically the uh, pulse sequence to prepare and measure the spin consists of uh, two laser pulses. Uh, one is to polarize, to orient the spin. The second one is to detect by measuring fluorescence. And in between, we apply microwave pulses to rotate the spin state. Now, depending on the end uh, state, there will be higher or lower fluorescence here during the readout pulse. And those are basic elements of uh, coherent control and readout. Uh, this pulse sequence uh, to control the spins can be more complicated, uh, but in the simplest case, uh, it's actually just the rotation of the spin. Um, if you scan the frequency of microwaves through the resonance, you see that you transfer the population uh, from the bright state, m is equal zero to a dark state, m is equal one or minus one. And there is a response in fluorescence intensity. So if you measure fluorescence intensity versus frequency in the external field, you can see the uh, negative uh, effect uh, of microwave on the fluorescence. So there is a negative magnetic resonance signal or optically detected magnetic resonance signal and that's allow you basically to measure also the frequency of your spin system. And now you can tune your uh, microwave in resonance with the spin transitions and rotate the spin uh, coherently. If you zoom in into the uh, lines, you can also detect uh, some more complex structures, triplets. And now you can start to think what it is. It's actually nuclear spin of N14 atom in a structure of the uh, NV center, it has a nuclear spin one and it splits the line into three it's kind of additional qubit on board. And we are going to talk about how to use it uh, a bit later. So it's possible to uh, also do magnetic resonance in an excited state. We mentioned that uh, it has similar structure, but with lower uh, zero field splitting, these lines in the excited state are broader because they decay uh, from the uh, excited state. There's a decay to the ground state. Nevertheless, you also can observe magnetic resonance in the excited state. Uh, so now how to rotate the spin. So that can be done by just tuning microwave in resonance with a spin transition. And uh, this uh, rotation uh, can be uh, observed as a Rabi oscillation by 
detecting the fluorescence after your application of resonant, uh, resonant microwave pulse. You can do it also very quickly with uh, frequencies going to hundreds of uh, megahertz or up to a gigahertz. With these very small microwave lines, you can get very strong microwave field at the location of your, your color centers and you can drive them very fast. And that's also important for coherent control experiments because it's allow you to fight uh, decoherence uh, in the system. So the better, the faster control you can get our systems, the better uh, toolkit uh, you can have to fight external perturbation and uh, uh, decoherence. Um, decay of Rambi flops is not necessarily uh, decoherence rate uh, or coherence time associated. Uh, actually, uh, for coherence time, which is one of the first benchmark uh, for any qubit, or any quantum sensor, it's important to define a few parameters. And I will very quickly go through them uh, together with you uh, to define what is a, a FID, free induction decay, what is a Han echo decay time. And we will see how these parameters are connected to performance of spins uh, as a quantum sensors or uh, elements of quantum uh, registers. So what is the coherence time, how we define it? Uh, the very first definition of a coherence time can be taken from a so-called Ramsey fringes experiment or free induction decay. So it's a sandwich between uh, two pi half pulses which rotates the electron spin of uh, a qubit, in our case, uh, a color center from the eigenstate where you polarize it from the MS equals zero state uh, to the equatorial plane. And so now during the uh, free evolution time, time between these pulses, the spin start to process. It evolves actually with a detuning uh, frequency between the carry of microwave and your eigenfrequency of the spin. And then you can convert this angle of uh, precession in the equatorial plane back to the uh, Z-X uh, of the uh, block sphere. And then you can measure optically the population of the uh, uh, states of NV center, which are optically distinguishable. So this results uh, in this pretty complex picture as you observe in the experiment. Uh, so it's an uh, optical signal as a function of the delay between two pi half pulses, it's a precession associated with uh, detuning, the phase decays because of the dephasing, this is a decoherence. And there's quite a complex, actually, not a single frequency picture, you see some beating, and this is because this uh, more complex picture of single transition associated with the splitting between uh, spin state related to hyperfine interaction of electron spin of NV center with uh, nuclear spin of uh, nitrogen. So this is the fastest decay you can observe in a system. System is not driven, it's a free induction decay. The qubit is exposed to all external perturbations. Any jittering in uh, eigenfrequency of the qubit will lead to dephasing in this experiment. And uh, a better way to handle coherence or keep coherence alive is to apply echo. So echoes uh, uh, can refocus uh, some decoherence. In the simplest case, it's a Han echo where you apply a pi pulse in the middle of your uh, free induction decay, pi half, pi half uh, sequence. This pi pulse refocuses uh, static fluctuations, uh, slow fluctuations of external fields leading to longer coherence time. Uh, here we are coming from microseconds to tens of microseconds uh, on NV center, and that helps you basically to, to handle very low frequency noise. So how uh, this ha happens in diamonds, so we need to look actually on an environment of NV center, why it all uh, coherence decays, uh, these perturbations or fluctuations associated with uh, other spins present in diamond. In the beginning of my lecture, I mentioned that 
control of material it's very essential to reach a long coherence time but in any solid state material there are spins the impurities that are not under control there there's always something that can sit in a lattice and in diamond those can be paramagnetic nitrogen atoms actually those are present in much higher concentration compared to nb centers uh, typically if you grow diamond they're usually 300 times more uh, nitrogen atoms than nb uh, and those are creating uh, noise so they're also carrying spins every of these atoms actually is the magnetic fluctuators and uh, they basically create the noise at the location of the NV center which is marked here as a as a red spin uh, a degree of control of material uh, in terms of purity now increased a lot and so this uh, uh, paramagnetic impurities like uh, uh, p1 centers that were present in in very first experiments and uh, creating very strong noise you could also observe them if you drive uh, your spin in resonance with them at level anti-crossing those can be removed to a very high degree up to a par billion purity or even better and now you can think that basically you now isolate your system by making better material and maybe there will be no decoherence. There are some other sources of decoherence in diamond, uh, namely carbon-13 nuclear spins. Um, diamond is made out of carbon and carbon do have 1% of natural abundance C13 isotope. And those uh, atoms, carbon-13 atoms carry nuclear spins also carrying a magnetic moment and making fluctuations in diamond but those spins are much quieter those are slower nuclear spins are better isolated from environment and uh, those are creating uh, magnetic noise but this magnetic noise has uh, a bit lower fluctuation frequency easier to handle using uh, our spin echoes and uh, those basically are creating some uh, complex uh, modulation and decay of the Han echo we uh, typically observe in the experiments. So actually, if you measure Han echo in the ultra pure diamond, having very, very few uh, nitrogen spins and many of these carbons, you will get this complex modulation pattern. These revivals of the echo are uh, scaling in the temporal position with a Lama precession frequency of carbon spins. So if you increase the magnetic fields, there's maxima get denser in time. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, appearance of revival and uh, collapses of the echo is uh, quite an intriguing uh, feature, but also have consequences, of course, on applications of uh, NV centers as qubits or sensors so because if you want to make a good sensor you want to have a coherence in the system so you want to be in the uh, maximum of this uh, echo decay curve now how they happens how these uh, revivals uh, are appearing so we are going to look a little bit in more details about uh, uh, in the physics of interaction of the central spin with uh, very few spins in the environment and uh, understand dynamics in a few minutes. In addition, there is also interaction with phonons. Uh, diamond is uh, a solid state lattice having phonons and spins are interacting very weakly for NV centers with phonons, but still uh, this interaction is present and uh, this decay uh, of interaction with phonons limits the coherence time at room temperature to about uh, six milliseconds uh, for the electron spin. So the, the message here, there are three levels of uh, decoherence, three sources of decoherence is electron spins in a diamond lattice, which can be taken under good control by growing very pure diamond. And this is P1 center, the source of decoherence. And there is a carbon-13 uh, nuclear spins and those uh, uh, lead to some uh, weaker and uh, lower frequency noise and also here is a topic purification of diamond can be done you can vary the concentration of uh, carbon 13 in your system 
and finally there are phonons uh, that lead to decoherence. This is the slowest process for uh, for NV centers, uh, but uh, this uh, this source is also present. So now, um, how the uh, center spin and V center interact with uh, these uh, qubits uh, that are present naturally in diamond carbon thirteen nuclear spins. So how to understand uh, this environment? How these uh, revivals of the echo happen? So can we use this uh, nuclear spin as a resource? Uh, in quantum technologies. This is something that we would like to discuss, and we will discuss this during uh, several lectures. But uh, at the first step to, uh, to understand the dynamics in more than one qubit system, I would like to introduce a very simple model how NV center and diamond can interact with uh, its uh, spin environment. So you assume the, the central spin and V center interacting with the nuclear spin. I can build a uh, simple semi-classical model where uh, you have the eigen energy of your uh, your spin, uh, and in this case we are going to use a spin half kind of a model. So it's NV center is not spin half, but for this sim simple model uh, it's a good enough approximation. Plus you have some noise now uh, coming from environment, and this noise magnetic noise create uh, dephasing. Uh, so this noise is coming from surrounding spins. In our case, uh, uh, it's a carbon-13 uh, nuclear spin bus. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, A value, the strengths of the interaction can be distributed uh, uh, Gaussian uh, uh, with Gaussian distribution, and that would lead to decay of the uh, coherence uh, 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 is to be uh, Gaussian. Uh, so this is basically FID decay, free induction decay. Remember the very first measure of coherence that we have introduced. And you can fight uh, this noise now if the noise is slow by introducing echoes like a pi pass in the middle. This echo unwind the uh, effect of your noise if the noise is static, and you will uh, recover coherence. And uh, Han echo we have discussed before, just single uh, pi pulse in the middle is the simplest way uh, to handle noise. There are also better ways to decouple uh, noise, and there can be many pi pulses. Uh, uh, that uh, basically do better job uh, for more complex uh, noise environment. Um, so if you apply uh, echo or higher order echoes with more uh, pulses, you can improve your coherence time. You can decouple the uh, uh, the the noise effects, the bass effects associated with carbon. Uh, from the electron spin of the in V center. And uh, this decoupling is very efficient to improve coherence time. With this, uh, even in a 1% uh, uh, content of uh, carbon 13 uh, diamond, you can get uh, close to millisecond, close to phonon limited T2 time uh, for uh, coherence time of the in V center. So the message is in general. Echo helps you to keep coherence. So the more pi pulses you apply, the better you can uh, get uh, your coherence time. Um, but in addition, there is also uh, a few nuclear spins that are interacting uh, stronger with your color center, and those can be actually distinguished from the bus. Remember, the, there is an interaction that lead to this uh, decay and revival of coherence before it's fully decays. And this can be also explained in a quite a simple model. So in V center is a system which do have a uh, magnetically quite uh, sublevel with magnetic quantum number m s equal zero. And in this case, nuclear spins around in V center uh, feel only external magnetic fields, and they're getting quantized along the external magnetic field. If you have in V center in MS equal one or minus one state, this state do carry magnetic moments. And so nuclear fields are strong 
magnetic field associated with interaction with uh, NV center. So there are now different quantization axes uh, for your nuclear spins. One is uh, when NV center is in MS equal zero state and the other quantization axis modified by the field of NV center if NV center is in MS equal one state and that's lead to complex dynamics for the nuclear spins. Now by flipping NV center force and back between different spins, you start to change the quantization axis of a nuclear spin and that lead to kind of a drive of the nuclear spins. And so complex uh, entangling and disentangling dynamics in NV center and uh, nuclear spin system. So that's lead to complex modulation pattern for every nucleus that is located in the vicinity of NV center. This modulation pattern do have two frequency components. Uh, one is a frequency uh, associated with, uh, um, with, uh, uh, with uh, NV center in MS equal one state. So this is a fast modulation. And another frequency component is associated with a Zeeman energy uh, of nuclear spin, so the flow, slow fluctuations. And uh, these uh, fast fluctuations are very individual. They are depending on the strength of interaction between NV centers and the nuclear spins. So if you look different uh, nuclear spins and analyze them, they all will have a di different uh, frequencies of modulation. And if you sum up all of them, because NV center is interacting with a variety of carbon uh, nuclear spin, they will end up in this uh, revival and uh, uh, decay of coherence. And so this revival and decay will basically go for a long time. Uh, but uh, this is basically analysis uh, for uh, nuclear spins that are coherently coupled to your NV center. Now there is more and more, more far away um, uh, located uh, nuclear spins, and those are creating a buzz that in the end will actually lead to decay of coherence. So the, you can distinguish nuclear spins that are located closer that uh, participate in a coherent interaction between them and NV center, and more far away nuclear spins that lead to overall decay of coherence time in your system. So you see it's a pretty complex system. Uh, so one single electron spin of NV center and a few nuclear spin, but already in this case, uh, just leaving them interact and measure lead to quite complex dynamics and uh, we can understand it in a uh, quite simple model. And uh, we can also see that we can handle using a coherent control, we can lead to a revival of coherence time uh, in this system. And so here is experimental observation uh, and analysis of this decay. Uh, you do see that there is a kind of a, a decay overall of echo with this revival uh, associated with the Larmor frequency of nuclear spins. At faster uh, time scale, there is also faster oscillation associated with this uh, additional field uh, that a nuclear spin is experiencing when in Vicente in is in MS equal one state. And uh, this uh, complex dynamics can be actually is associated with just a few nuclear spins uh, near in Vicente. Uh, if you look carefully in the uh, time uh, sequence of these revivals, there is a surprise that uh, frequency is a bit higher than Valarmor frequency of carbon-13, and that comes from the mixing of the uh, state of NV center in external fields. Uh, it's uh, then uh, nuclear spin state uh, for nuclei that are located close are not exactly the uh, eigen uh, states uh, of uh, nuclear spin. There is a bit of admixture of the electron spin character leading to larger G factor and uh, this for low magnetic field uh, is, can be quite essential. Actually, you can have uh, uh, enhancement on, uh, on uh, precession frequency to be a few times compared to a bar nuclear spin frequency. For higher magnetic fields, these two systems decouple and you'll gain your normal bar nuclear spin magnetic moment and that lead to uh, 
like more um, standard uh, G factor for nuclear spins. Right, so, so far I was uh, discussing uh, uh, very basic experiments that are repeated uh, many, many times in order to get the signal. So you prepare your spin uh, using optical pumping, you rotate your spin uh, using microwave, you measure uh, your, your spin, but typically when you try to measure, uh, not all the photons are reaching detector and uh, most of the time you lose all the photons uh, on a time scale before you repolarize the spin. In most of the cases uh, where you attempt to measure, you fail. And so you need to uh, repeat experiments many, many times. So most of the experiments we were shown before uh, are done this way. And uh, it's very important for um, well, some elements of quantum technology, especially for quantum computing, but also in sensing and metrology, uh, to be able to measure spins more efficiently in a QND manner, QND in quantum non demolition. Uh, scenario. What does it mean? So if I give you a quantum system, uh, so you can ask yourself, can I measure this quantum system efficiently in terms of uh, every time get an answer uh, where the system is in spin one or spin zero, even without repeating, so without losing too much information. Uh, these QND measurements are usually hard uh, or harder for NV centers, but they are possible. And there are two ways uh, to uh, perform them. One is actually uh, go to low temperature, uh, allowing to uh, make optical transitions to be uh, spin selective. At low temperature, remember we had this G2 function of light uh, from NV center with Rabi flops. What does it mean? It means that optical transition having long coherence time. So optical lines are very sharp and they can be so sharp that uh, laser can be tuned to one of the spin transition and not touching the other. In this case, in V center will start to scatter photon only for one particular spin state. In other spin state will be detuned. And if detuning is large enough compared to optical Rabi frequency or to your selection, so you can now start to scatter photons only from one transition, not from another. So why does it make a difference to previous experiment where you excite all the spin state? Well, the difference is that you can now repeat measurements many times. Of course, already first measurement project your quantum system in one of the eigenstate, but it doesn't repolarize your system immediately. So you can repeat your measurement again and again and again and find your system in the same spin state. So you can do non-demolition or quantum non-demolition measurements. So the name can be a bit confusing maybe, right? Quantum non-demolition, it's demolition for arbitrary state, but it preserves the eigenstates. The first measurement, project your system in one of the eigenstates. In this case, it will be either been in zero state or not. But the next measurement will find the system in the same in the same state, and you can repeat these measurements many times. And even if you lose some of the photons, uh, because you repeat many times your measurements, you will get enough photons to give an answer. So this is one of the ways how you can handle it. Uh, the other uh, way to handle uh, performance of the measurements and reach Q and D limit that works also for room temperature is to use auxiliary nuclear spin spins that we were discussing before as kind of an additional register. Yes, please. How far the other spin states are in energy separated? Yeah, that's like, the question is, uh, what is the splittings here? So the, the G factor in the excited state is a little bit uh, uh, different from the ground state, so it's quite different. And so by um, uh, there is additional spin orbit interaction here and the difference in frequency, if you do um, a, a frequency spectrum, is on the gigahertz range. We will see this in a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, so why we do QND measurements? So if we, we measure first time and we know where the system is, why to measure again, right? 
Um, so the so what is the what is the reason? So the the point is uh, when you try when you try to measure, uh, you might have been measured it, but you might uh, miss your result because you don't collect this photon. So it's very important in some scenario where a lossy detection channel to be able to afford. Uh, to not detect all the measurements events. And that's why this repetition, ability to repeat the measurements to compensate for losses is very important. In this particular case, if I, for example, would now shine my laser and get scattered photons. So some of them are lost on the interface of diamond and get reflected to wrong direction. Some of them are not detected by my avalanche photodiode, but so ability to repeat allow you basically to uh, to live with a highly lossy channel. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are two ways. Uh, one is very direct. Uh, tune your laser and see only one spin state, and the other will be kind of uh, quiet for you. And the other is more complex to have another qubit. And I will start with this first uh, uh, way to measure the spin states. Uh, so this is now uh, related to the question we had, uh, how the spectrum looks like. So the excited state is uh, affected a bit by spin-orbit interaction uh, and effectively have different energy level splittings. And so if you now tune your laser, you, you will not have degenerated transition between uh, 0, 0 and 1, 1, because the splittings here are different. The, uh, zero starting transition going to zero and this is a loud transition will be a bit tuned from minus one to minus one and they can be now uh, visualized in a, in a fluorescence excitation spectrum where you kind of now start to see separated spectral lines and this uh, allow you to tune the laser to one of the transitions and not to excite the other and uh, now there is also additional complications come. Some of this transition are not very long cycling. Uh, we have just discussed it, so you need to repeat the measurement many times. But if there are some forbidden transition which breaks the cycle and the system fall into wrong state, this is all for your measurements. So with this, you already destroyed your eigenstate. And so you have to choose the right transition here. And one of the transition from, uh, uh, from this uh, full spectrum is very long cycling. Fortunately, so this long cycle, so thousands of uh, scattered photons without flip, um, allow you to measure the state by tuning the laser there. So because you can scatter thousands of photons, you can afford to lose 99%. It will be still 10 photons arriving to your detector. And you know, noise on 10 photons is about square root of n3. So you have a more than one signal to noise. And so that's success to the readout of the, of the spin state. And this is a, an experiment by Ronald Hansen group. Uh, again, you see the same uh, spectrum. Just see that. Uh -huh. uh, so you see the spectrum, you, you pick up the long cycling transition and uh, you tune the laser there and now you, know, you look on a time trace of scattered photons and these time frames show jumps. Uh, these gems are uh, basically showing you sometimes you are in resonance with laser, and so this is where you catch your transition, sometimes you are not. And uh, well, the gems also show you that the system is not fully isolated. It goes forth and back between spin states. It can be related to magnetic noise, but you can observe this uh, uh, quantum gems of the single electron spin here. The time scale is, of course, uh, uh, quite short. Uh, uh, we are scattering photons on a nanoscale. Uh, the flips are on a millisecond scale, but so you still have enough photons to detect, to put a threshold here. And uh, the, the fidelity can be quite high, actually, in, especially in last experiments. Now, <clears throat> there is also another way to do this QND measurement. Uh, if you have uh, more than uh, one spin system in your register. And this method is particularly interesting because it also works at room temperature. Uh, so in V centers uh, uh, is a system with a long spin lifetime at room temperature, but detectability of the spin uh, is also important. And so if you have this nuclear spin nearby, you can use it to prolong the lifetime of the spin state, at least of eigenstate. 
And uh, that's essentially allow you to perform now QND measurements in the spin register containing NV center spin and uh, the spin of nuclei uh, in, in the vicinity of the NV center. Uh, there are several scenarios how you can do these measurements. I'm going to show you also the movie later on. Uh, but uh, the first one was realized using this nitrogen 14 nuclear spin. Uh, remember, the, the spectral line of NV center is split it into three components. We have seen it several times once in the spectrum, another time we have seen this beating in a free induction decay. And this nitrogen nuclear spin actually is more decoupled from environment than NV center electron spin. When you shine the light, uh, it polarizes electron spin of NV center, so it ends your measurements ability within polarization time, but the nitrogen spin is not touched. So nuclear spin is not directly affected by your polarization uh, effects uh, of the NV spin. And now what you can do, you can uh, essentially uh, make a small uh, quantum gate between uh, nuclear spin uh, associated with this nitrogen nuclei and in V center electron spin. So you map the uh, state of uh, uh, nuclear spin on the electron spin, and then you measure the electron spin. And the nuclear spin is not affected. Of course, it affected is projected by measurements, of course, but it's not repolarized during this time. So you can now go again as before with your laser and measure again. And with this, you can accumulate several measurement results on your NV center. Uh, and that will allow you to measure this nuclear spin in a QND manner because you can repeat measurement many times. Yeah, so how practically we can do this gate. So remember, you have to now flip your electron spin depending on the state of the nuclear spin. But you have this three frequency component in the spectrum. So the, uh, the states are separated by hyperfine interaction. Now, like in the case with a laser, you can tune your microwave in one of the components, not touching another, and do pi pulses, flipping every time, uh, electron spin only for case if you are in one particular nuclear spin state sublevel. And that's exactly <coughs> what this, uh, this sequence is, uh, uh, is requiring. So you, with this flip, you, you correlate your, uh, your nuclear spin state with uh, electron spin state, which is now your measurement device, or this is equivalent to this uh, quantum gate uh, in, 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 this, in this case of the, uh, of the circuit. Um, so the result of this measurement is shown here for nitrogen nuclear spin. So you have uh, flips between um, bright state and dark state. In this case, the contrast is not 100% because this MS equal one state is also a little bit fluorescent, but it's differently fluorescent, it's darker. And so you can have now gems, quantum gems of the uh, single nuclear spins. You can also uh, plot the histogram of photon counts. So you have bright and dark intervals, and now you can uh, plot the number of events to be bright in this photon counting histogram or to be dark. And this histogram now will have two peaks and two peaks uh, to be distinguishable, say that you can put now a threshold here in a brightness. And every time when your NV center is uh, lower in fluorescence than the threshold, it's correspond to one nuclear spin state. And if you are uh, having a brightest uh, state or brighter uh, fluorescence, it has above the threshold. Uh, and it tells you that you are in a, in a different nuclear spin state. That's you can do at room temperature and it uh, gives you access to room temperature, single nuclear spin state. You can measure it. And interestingly, you can also polarize it by measurements. So actually doing this display this for a single nuclear spin by watching of it, you can prepare it with very high fidelity. Uh, actually nuclear spin state, remember the, the energy space in between the states is extremely weak, so it's in a megahertz level. So it's fully thermalized to the and normal conditions. So the, the plus and minus states sort of are equally populated, but by measuring, you can fully cool your nuclear spin by just watching it. So it's a kind of interesting feature, which do have consequences in error correction protocols, for example. 
So it's a strong measurement. So it's measurement that polarizes the quantum system. But for nuclear spin of nitrogen, this lifetimes of the state is still a little bit short to appreciate it uh, basically on a second time scale because there is still some flip-flops. This is a nuclear spin which is directly in the structure of Invisent and there are some flip-flops. You can make it slower by high magnetic field, but there is also another way to do it. And so today we are talking about this nuclear spin surrounding color centers. And uh, uh, today I would like to uh, show you here some better nuclear spin than this nitrogen. Nuclear spins that are weaker complete, uh, that don't have any perpendicular component of hyperfine interactions, that don't do any flip flops. And those are located actually either on the X of NV center. So uh, here it's a piece of uh, diamond structure, a cluster of carbons. Uh, and you see that there are some that are exactly on the X of NV center. And NV center is a magnetic dipole in the first approximation. So it will produce a field that is along the X. Uh, and this nuclear spin will only feel the axial field. So that means there is no perpendicular component and there is no flip-flops. These nuclear spins, are, if you don't touch them with a the radio wave, they will not flip because of the dynamics of the NV center, because there is no perpendicular component. So the, the NV center will keep the, the uh, quantization X to be always the same. So it's not like the case we discussed before, where we have this entangling and disentangling and revival of the echo. This is all signs of the flip-flops. Now here, uh, those spins don't have any reason to make flip-flops because those are located exactly on the X of the NV center. So this is in a simple model. However, uh, NV center is a system in a solid state and is not point magnetic dipole. It has a more complex wave function, which can have a deviation from this, but at the first approximation for relatively far away nuclear spin, not for this one. Uh, this approximation holds pretty well. So this is a wave function of an NV center and uh, uh, so this is a side view and this is a top view and now you see it's not really magnetic dipole so it's a very complex kind of a wave function still very localized compared to other solid state systems and this contour is about a one percent of spin density so it's a, a kind of cover must of the spin density of the NV center and uh, uh, so those nuclear spin blockading here on the top and here on the bottom don't really experience so much of the contact term of the hyperfine interaction that would lead to holding the argument we had before. Uh, but then quantum chemistry calculations that if you look, take this all this wave function into account tells you that the, they are these axial spins that have very long spin lifetime. So those are very, very stable. They're expected to be very, very stable, but there are some other which are non-axial that also should have very, very long uh, spin lifetime. And those are uh, located on equatorial plane. This is now NV center. Those are axial spins that are supposed to be very stable. And there's even more located in the equator. And the reason for this, so magnetic dipole do have also the vertical field on the equator. So there are two points here and here where it's kind of along the X of NV center. In addition, these equatorial spins do have a vanishing uh, contact term because at the location of the carbon, there is a, a very low uh, spin density of the electron spin. Again, this dipolar approximation holds here. Kind of. And this intuitive way how to find stable carbons uh, is holding for several carbons around in this center. It's also now give you a bit of feeling that uh, this uh, still a solid state system and the wave function is very complex and you have to understand this uh, properties of solid state material very well, but it also tells you that there are a few carbons that are like uh, in a very simple toy model uh, system. And you can do the same trick. Uh, you can make now uh, gates and measure this, but those are much more stable. There's no flip-flops. You can allow yourself to measure for a very long time. And here I show you the, uh, the movie from the lab in the real time. It's now fluorescence of the NV center. And now there is a nuclear spin of carbon-13, which is uh, 
very stable. It stays there for a few uh, seconds and it's really a uh, very low field, nothing special. And then it jumps force and back because you know, fully isolated your system. There are some radio frequency components or uh, some other noise that lead to the flip. Um, it's also, you know, magnetometer in the end. Uh, but this happens on the uh, on the second uh, second time scale. Yeah, so this is essentially uh, the way to measure the spin state in a QND manner, much more efficient manner. And this creates you another important argument in a toolkit to control the system. So you can polarize, you can measure, uh, you can have a few qubits in it, uh, and you also can measure strongly, efficiently uh, in a QND way. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you can do it under ambience. So remember the, the setup was uh, really under ambient condition, room temperature, no vacuum. And so you can still have a quite isolated, uh, quite isolated uh, spins uh, in this system. Yes. Uh, so this is a real time scale you see so the, the question was uh, what was the time scale of this so this uh, movie that we do see it is a real time scale so i can uh, try to launch it again to appreciate the time scale um oops. Uh, so this is basically a real time. So it's about uh, a few seconds. It stays in the same time and it jumps to the other. Um, so you can make it even longer if you apply uh, field more uh, precise uh, along the axis uh, of the NV centers. Now, how long it takes to flip. So it's still uh, actually in this case, still an interaction between flip-flops, some of residual, and, and that lead to... Um, it's actually related to some imperfection of the field alignment. So you can do it even better. So yeah, remember there are microwave pulses going on and you assume that pulse only flip the electron spin and not flip in nuclear spin. And there is, if there is some kind of forbidden transition, so it can start to touch it. So there is a thousand and thousands of microwave pulses are running behind it. And uh, so they are not touching nuclear spin. And if, if this don't hold very well, then that leads to this. Uh, to yeah. Mm -hmm. so this and so that's very important question and remember uh, the, the protocol so the protocol has uh, the same like for nitrogen so it's a gate and so the gate uh, speed is exactly the hyperfine coupling so for this nuclear spin the coupling is about a uh, hundred kilohertz so the gate speed so the, this kind of a mapping is about uh, 10 microseconds. So the, but you also need to repolarize electron spin afterwards and so on. So it's a few tens of microseconds. And so it's basically, uh, that's why it's thousands of time per second. So this is your rate you, you, you can measure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fine. I think I just went a bit uh, shorter, but uh, I think I, so we had essential elements of introduction to physics of NV centers, and uh, we can continue this afternoon. Thank you for your attention.